Theohumanism, Blog 6, Deep Citizenship. The focus of this blog is deep citizenship. Deep citizenship means to be governed by one's own convictions. It's about a democratic covenant. The idea of the social contract, where the state governs us, only weakens us. A democratic covenant is about we the people, together, in view of a higher order. Why bring in a higher order? Why not just we the people? It's a matter of conscience. The conscience, the basis of our claim to self-govern, is a higher order authority. During the Cold War, we the people often let the state do our thinking for us. It's called state think. Today, amidst the culture war, we the people often let social media do our thinking for us. Groupthink only leads to identity politics in the end. To get a better handle on deep citizenship, we look to Alexis de Tocqueville, 19th century French thinker, whose celebrated work, Democracy in America, continues to offer insight into our ever-vibrant American character. So let's be clear, we're considering deep citizenship American style. Other peoples do freedom differently. They may see our notions of freedom as excessive. But all peoples aspire to be free of tyranny. Liberty is a universal. De Tocqueville was a keen observer of the American character. One thing he said, and it's not easy for us to grasp today, is that in America, religion is the engine of freedom. In contrast to old Europe, where, as he noted, religion and freedom move in opposite directions, in the U.S., he observed, they move together hand in hand. Strange, de Tocqueville was well aware that the U.S. Constitution forbids the establishment of religion, just as it forbids the state authority over religion. And yet, he seems to suggest that religion in America is the basis of democracy. Is your freedom about being religious, about being bound to a higher order? De Tocqueville, in observing Americans, noted that they so completely blur Christianity and freedom that they can't conceive the one without the other. We have a more diverse society today, but the America that de Tocqueville observed was religiously diverse in its own way and included people whose religion was no religion. In saying that Americans blurred religion and freedom, de Tocqueville was saying that being religiously free is necessary for the maintenance of civic life. The point holds today despite the shift in religious demographics. Religious liberty American style is actually a single word. Religion and liberty in the U.S. are irrevocably linked. We're free because we're religiously free. Free to discover our own beliefs and morals and free to be governed by them, not by state think in our civic life. Our convictions, that's the area where the state has no sovereignty over us. To be a U.S. citizen is to be religious by constitutional design. Sounds very strange. Here's how it works. If you're American, you have the right to self-govern, but this right assumes you have a conscience. A conscience only works when it's attuned to a higher order authority. When your conscience is reduced to lower order authorities, political power, or the stock market, social media, celebrity lifestyle, video games, it loses its capacity to guide you. You can get involved in all those things, but if you're not attuned to your own higher order authority when you do so, you end up obedient to voices not your own. You're no longer self-governing. The celebrated Muslim thinker of the 14th century, Ibn Khaldun, made this point in his introduction to the study of history. If you're not ruled, he said, by a higher authority that has its abode in yourself, you'll end up ruled by a power other than yourself. You'll come to identify with that power, even surrender your freedom to it in exchange for its protection. Not governed by your inner higher order authority, you end up governmentalized, corporatized, infantilized, 
deauthorized, de-democratized. By the U.S. Constitution, religion is the area the state can't touch. Oddly, it's in the name of religion that we self-govern. How do you exercise your conscience, the metaphysical authority that gives you the freedom to govern yourself, the freedom to be democratic? To be sure, nobody's judging. You can live by your whims. However, it's not living by whims that makes you a citizen, but living by your convictions, which govern you only when you're ever more attuned to the authority of your conscience. We're talking about religion not in the traditional sense, but in the constitutional sense. According to the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, we the people are religiously free. The state is not sovereign over us when it comes to our beliefs and morals. In other words, if you're not clear about your beliefs and morals, you're at risk of losing your capacity to self-govern. Religious liberty means we the people, individuals and communities, are free to discover our own beliefs and morals and to participate in the politics of the land in accordance with them. A point of clarification is in order. Separation of church communities and state does not mean separation of church communities and politics. Your U.S. citizenship is greatly maligned if you're forced to repress your deepest convictions in public. We can speak of two practical benefits when it comes to religious liberty. First, humans are readier to act to obtain a good when free to do so on the basis of their own convictions. Religious liberty, the first liberty, has spillover effects. Free to live by your own beliefs and morals, you're readier to act, innovate, do things by your own inspiration rather than by submitting to state administration. Second, religious liberty is more attuned to democratic freedom than it is to individual autonomy. Individual autonomy, important as it may be, is the license to do what you want apart from others. In contrast, democratic freedom means to self-govern for the common good. Similarly, Religious liberty is about acting on the basis of our own convictions, given to us by our conscience, which, if healthy, takes into account the good of others as it takes into account one's own good. In other words, religious liberty is the condition for being democratic, for ruling as we the people in light of our consciences, which, since they're not subject to a state-enforced hierarchy, enable us to self-govern. But here's the kicker. The conscience is only sovereign, only capable of ruling, because it speaks to us of a higher order. So, if you're not acting with a greater goodness in mind, you're actually not acting according to your conscience as your higher order authority. And in that case, you risk losing your religious liberty and your capacity to self-govern. Conscience is what ties us to the common good, including the capacity to dissent from public opinion that is not attentive to the common good. But conscience is not a singular phenomenon. It's first formed in family and community, but consciences can and do clash. The reason for the clash is partly due to the fact that we have different conceptions of conscience. There are two general views. The first says conscience is a personal matter beyond objective criteria. It's the inner conversation one has with oneself. The second view holds that such a personalistic view of conscience won't stand up to state law. The state won't tolerate claims to be exempt from a law simply because one feels it doesn't accord with one's inner voice. Thus, to shore up the power of the conscience against the power of the state, objective criteria are needed to decide on the soundness of a conscience claim. For example, what science tells us and tradition affirms. However, advocates of the first view that conscience can't be tied to objective criteria push back. 
Tying conscience to science and tradition, they say, is only to impose a hierarchy on individuals who don't recognize such things. And history shows that science can be used to dominate. A century ago, scientists backed the idea of eugenics, the idea that some races are genetically superior. Bottom line, conscience is not science. You need not be educated in modern science to have a healthy conscience. Science is limited to analysis of the physical world. Conscience isn't a physical thing. It's a higher order authority beyond the claims of science, even if not in principle opposed to them. But we often miss the point. We often assume that our conscience is healthy simply because we readily submit to modern science. It is important to listen to what science tells us about nature and also about human life. But science alone is not enough for the conscience to remain healthy. We have to cultivate our consciences as higher order authorities on a daily basis if we're not to be ruled by voices not our own. The conscience, however it's formed, only serves its purpose when it's tied to a higher authority a voice in the depths of your soul that is not your voice, but the voice of a higher authority, higher than the state. This metaphysical voice in you calls you to acknowledge not power, but goodness as your purpose in life, and it keeps you from going wrong and doing evil. It's about you governing yourself. What is religion exactly? It's not as mutable as we might think. It's not a flavor of ice cream, this week vanilla, next week chocolate. It's a set of truths people take seriously. In that sense, religion is closely aligned with conscience. You can separate conscience from religion in the traditional sense, but you can't separate religion in the traditional sense from conscience. The close connection, religion and conscience, is implied in the constitutional clause on religious liberty. The First Amendment assumes that you take your truths seriously. Truth be told, religion in the constitutional sense, religion in the traditional sense, they're actually not unrelated. Churches have always been the wellspring of the habits of the heart, the building blocks of the nation's civil religion that allows us to engage one another civilly even harmoniously, giving the nation its moral coherence. And praying in community has long been a place to sharpen the conscience and habituate it to its higher order authority apart from state oversight. After all, church is the place where the state has no place. Religion constitutionally defined, the civic authority the state can't touch, needs a people ready to sing hymns of liberation together. Democracy needs a shared cultivation of higher authority, not religion as individual taste, but as the spirit of civic life. De Tocqueville saw religion in the U.S. as undergirding our civic life, our capacity to govern our own affairs together. Civic life, it's about your town, your association, your community, working out its salvation and not ceding authority over it to the state. To get a better sense of what de Tocqueville saw in the U.S. in terms of religion and civic life, it's useful to think of citizens as both neighbors and strangers. It's a biblical concept. The Bible doesn't speak of people as citizens, but as neighbors and strangers. However, the idea of citizens as envisioned by the U.S. Constitution is not unrelated to the biblical concepts of neighbors and strangers. At the heart of our deep citizenship is the idea that we're both neighbors and strangers to one another. Being both neighbor and stranger means to act out of one's conscience. As neighbors, we act towards one another in view of a common good, the nation. We do this out of the common good convictions we discover when we're attuned to our conscience. At the same time, because we have a conscience, we're strangers to one another. Your conscience is not my conscience. We have to allow citizens to be strangers to one another in this sense. If we didn't, 
if we thought that we the people should share the same beliefs and morals, the state would have to manage them, and then we'd no longer be religiously free. To put it differently, as neighbors, we're committed to the rights of all to share in the common good, but as strangers, we're not expected to celebrate convictions that are not our own. De Tocqueville observed that in the U.S., in contrast to old Europe, what prevents one person from having all the power is religion as the great equalizer. As he noted, it's because of religious liberty that those in power can't claim religion as their prerogative. As a result, religion in the U.S. becomes the basis of what de Tocqueville called the equality of conditions. All citizens have a divine inheritance. There's neither rich nor poor, neither homeland born nor immigrant, neither black nor white, male nor female. All are one in the transcendent authority at work in the conscience that is the basis of the people's divine right to self-govern. De Tocqueville was not blind to the existence of hierarchies in our history. Rather, he was looking at the greater arc of our history. How religion in the U.S. became the basis of our freedom rather than a tool of state tyranny is a fascinating story. At the heart of the story is a biblical idea, covenant sovereignty. Long before our nation came into being, religious communities claimed that because they were covenanted to a higher order authority, they had the capacity to self-govern apart from the king's majesty. Covenant sovereignty is not the same thing as democratic freedom, but the former idea is implicit in the latter one. Like covenant sovereignty, democratic freedom is deeper than individual autonomy. It's a people governing itself. We can now better see why religious liberty is so important for all. Whether religious in the traditional sense or not, you're not free unless you're religiously free. In other words, your democratic freedom, your freedom to self-govern, assumes that you're possessed of a higher order authority beyond the state that empowers you to discover your own beliefs and morals, your own convictions, and to be governed by them as you participate in the politics of the nation. Lose your religious liberty, your higher order authority, you risk losing all your freedoms. Freedom is a burden. It takes effort to be governed by your own higher order authority. Easier to let others do the thinking for you. De Tocqueville stated the matter in very stark terms. A democracy, he said, runs the risk of turning majority opinion into its religion. How to avoid the pitfall? He posited, a people is not its own master if it has not submitted to God, because if it hasn't, someone or something else becomes its God. What keeps us metaphysically on point as a nation, ensuring our higher authority over mortal deities that would happily do our thinking for us, the mass media that masquerade as the nation's higher spirit? Here's the thing. Yoga won't maintain our civic life. It's a stress releaser, makes one feel spiritual, but there's no evidence it strengthens commitment to the good of all. It's not religion as observed by de Tocqueville, the thing that keeps us attuned to we the people together. We need the public sector, government. We need the private sector, the market. But we also need the conscience sector so that we're not ruled by the state or by the market or even by public opinion as if they're the higher authorities over us. Without a conscience sector stimulus, we'll lose sight of deep citizenship and in time of democracy as our national pride. A conscience sector stimulus is a call to do theology better as a nation. Doing theology better is not about elevating one community over others. It's about all of us thinking about democracy not simply as a set of governmental procedures, not simply as a set of checks and balances, but more profoundly as deep citizenship. We are moving towards the idea of a democratic covenant. Rising generations recognize 
that democracy as a contract with the state is not enough. They now envision the nation as citizens bound together by a common good that can't be achieved by state policies and market forces alone. A democratic covenant is not about changing structures and institutions. It's not about anarchy. It's about sharpening our moral senses as a people, lest, left to our own individual autonomy, we all end up divided and conquered. Religious liberty is a core part of the conscience sector, but religious liberty cannot be reduced to exemptions for religious communities from laws that are at odds with their particular teachings. Important as exemptions are, religious liberty is first and foremost about the deep citizenship of all. For a conscience sector stimulus to happen, public schooling, shaper of the nation's imaginary, will have to keep up with the course of the nation and better equip students with awareness of the nation's higher order. It's not about whether the founding was religious or secular, it's about the future of democracy as our national pride. In the meantime, do your nation a favor. Ask your neighbors and your colleagues, even strangers, how their metaphysical authority is doing today. Help keep the conscience sector alive and humming. Yes, voting is vital for democracy, but democracy can't live by voting alone. We're only a democracy if we're acting for a common good as our consciences dictate. Only in that way are we truly free. Let me end, as always, with some questions. How do you cultivate the higher authority in your soul that is key to our nation's civic life? In what ways do you govern your society in the name of your religion, constitutionally speaking? Until the next Theohumanism posting, adios.